Now you've got me. Hello.
Good afternoon, everybody. It's just after two o'clock on a Thursday, and this is now our regular spot for a ACSI webinar, and a hearty welcome to every single one of you who've joined us. Uh, it's such a privilege for me, Sean Moore, as the leader of the ACSI team, to welcome every single one of you. Um, a special word of welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. It's so exciting that um, every week we get um, uh, Christian teachers or teachers from all over. And in fact, we, we've had some Christian teachers from India who've joined us in the past weeks, and uh, we're so excited about that. We've got uh, teachers in Zimbabwe, in Eswatini, in Botswana, and then of, of course, South Africa. To those of you who are not part of ACSI schools, a particular welcome to you. It's a, it's a delight for us to host you this afternoon, and uh, we encourage you to share uh, this opportunity uh, with your friends. Uh, for us, this is kingdom work. If we can help in any way, um, education, and especially Christian education, a, um, around our Southern Africa, around the world, in fact, uh, that's what we, we want to do. Um, so welcome. I really hope that this afternoon is going to be a real blessing for you, that you're going to learn a lot. Uh, we've got a great friend of ACSI in uh, Robin Vinant, who's going to share with us this afternoon. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Kathy, um, Kathy Moore, who looks after the ECD sector within ACSI. She'll introduce Robin to you. And then we'll hand over to Robin for a, about 25, 30 minutes, and she'll share what's on her mind and the topic that she's going to speak to us this afternoon about. And then there'll be an opportunity, opportunity for you to ask some questions. Um, so um, as the questions come to mind, type them in, and then we'll manage the questions. So the last sort of 15 minutes of this afternoon, we'd love to engage with you as much as you can. Um, or you may have a comment that you'd like to add that we can share. Um, but that opportunity will come uh, once, once Robin has, has done uh, what, she, what she's presented for us this afternoon. Um, we would like to just to take a moment um, before we start. And, and, and for us at ACSI is to keep recognizing the work that you as teachers and, and leaders of your schools are doing. Um, just the fact that you're here this afternoon is, is, is such a feather in your cap because you're taking time out to learn more about um, the job that you're doing. And you know, the season of the last couple of months has been really trying for many of our teachers. So we take our hats off to you. We honor you. We pray for you on a daily basis that um, God would give you the strength that you need to, um, to do what you're called to do. Uh, and thank you so much for just investing in yourself. And, and as I said, I hope that you go back tomorrow to your class, whether it be at home um, or, or at school itself, just enriched and blessed and with some, some more things to think about. Um, so um, welcome to everyone again. Um, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hand over to Kathy who will introduce Robin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, these times of connection. Uh, Lord, we lift up our nation to you today. Um, amidst the chaos and another little season of uncertainty. Father, I pray that you be with our leaders. I pray that you be with the Minister of Education. Bless her, Lord. Bless her team and bless the leaders of our nation as they, as they make these weighty decisions um, uh, about not only education, about all things that affect us. Um, but Lord, as they, as they make decisions about education, give them great wisdom and discernment. So we lift them up to you today. Lord, I lift up to you the teachers that are joining us and even those that are not with us today from all around the world. We pray your blessing upon them, Lord. Thank you for them and the work that they do. Enrich them, Lord. Um, grow them, strengthen them. And Lord, we pray for your protection and your, and your, and your provision uh, for them and their respective families. Lord, bless their schools in every way. And Lord, again, I pray that you would be present in each heart and each mind, uh, wherever they may be sitting today, uh, that you would speak through uh, Robin to every single one of us today. Lord, thank you for Robin. Thank you for her heart. Thank you for the work that she's done with ACSI for all these years. Why don't you just bless her, Lord, as she speaks to us. May her words be your words. And um, may her impact be, be everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good. I'm going to disappear and then I'm going to hand over to, to, to Kathy and uh, uh, she's going to introduce Robin. Good afternoon once again. Sorry. Good afternoon once again from Johannesburg. 
Berg this afternoon. Um, what an honour and privilege it is to have you with us again today. And we are just so privileged to have so many people that are willing to come and share their expertise with us. But it's my joy and pleasure to introduce Robin Vinan to you this afternoon. I met Robin about three years ago when I came to Johannesburg again. Sorry, we're just sorting out. Okay, I'm going to start again, Robin. It is such a joy and pleasure to introduce Robin to you this afternoon. I met Robin about three years ago when I came to live in Johannesburg again. I am so grateful to have Robin in my life as she has become a friend and a mentor and I'm learning so much from her about the ECD sector. Robin is the founder of the Play With A Purpose education program and she is also the CEO of Preschools for Africa. Robin has worked tirelessly in the NGO space for about 30 years, mentoring a lot of ECD sites across the country. Robin also advocated for ECD at local and national government level. She has published a lot of research on early, ed early education. Robin, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us this afternoon. I know that many of us are hungry for information on how to deal with our children in these unusual times that we find ourselves in. May God bless you for being so willing to be with us. And over to you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here. And I'm just seeing the participants adding on there as they're going, and it's really great to have you. Um, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Sean, for that introduction. Really appreciate it, and it's great being a partner with ACSI. Play and play deprivation is something that's really close to my heart. Um, there's just so much that's been happening in the last few months all over the world. And being the founder of something called Play With A Purpose, I obviously believe wholeheartedly in learning through play. Um, and this has really prompted me the last few months to really start digging deep into finding out what are the effects on our children of what is happening at the moment. And I'm going to just switch to sharing my screen because I have a presentation here. So as, you, as I go through this, please just put your questions in the chat. Kathy will pick them up later and then we'll have a time at the end for questions. So let's just go through this and please ask your questions in the chat and we'll see what we can do. Um, I need to be able to share my screen. Should be okay now, Robin. Okay, got it, got it. There we go. Okay. Can you see that? Perfect. Okay, so really just talking about play deprivation and what's happened to us in the last few months with this. And I think the most important thing is that every child has a right to play. And they've got a right. It's all, whoopsie, it's in the... Um, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, that they've got the right to rest and leisure and to engage in play. So it's actually a right. It's not, a, um, it's not just something we think is very nice for our children. And I'm going to be talking now mainly to ECD practitioners, but obviously I know that there are quite a few parents here as well. And this has really impacted us both because we are partners in getting our children through life. And I thought I'd look at what is play. And it's quite interesting that there are no actual definitions of play that everybody agrees on. So putting it all together, we come through to this definition that it's a vehicle by which all human beings develop communication and social skills, creativity, problem solving. And it's been identified as being absolutely essential for human survival. Now that's really interesting um, to look at that. And these people who I've got mentioned at the bottom here, they have said, play is intrinsically motivated. It needs to be self-chosen, self-directed, 
And the player is always free to play must be freely chosen. It's an activity in which means are more valued than the ends. Play must be pleasurable, guided by mental rules. It's non-literal. It's actively engaged in by the players. You can't be a bystander and call it playing. Now that's really interesting. <laughs> but why do we have to play? And I think this is fascinating because many people think play is just something children do, but it's actually something that's essential for brain development, particularly in our preschool children. And there's a lot of research that says the brain actually grows when it plays. Therefore, if children are not playing, their brains actually aren't growing. And that's quite a scary thought for the whole lot of us. So some of the questions that we're looking at were, is play really important? Does it have a place? If play is important, what happens to human beings if they're deprived of play? And interestingly enough, as I was preparing this, a lot of the questions were thrown back at myself. And being an ECD practitioner, um, like many of you are, and being a parent as well, a lot of these questions came back to me and looked at well, what happens. I have been deprived of play. I know the last few months in lockdown, well, the first three weeks, as a family, we played a lot of games. We did a lot of card games, board games, things we did. We played things over Zoom. Um, and it was quite interesting to notice the more we went, the more we sort of got worried, got tied up with things, the less place we had for play. Um, and this has been actually a real wake-up call for me because if play is important, what happens to even us as adults if we're being deprived of that play? And the big thing about play is that it benefits all the domains. First of all, it provides a meaningful context for our children so that they can learn concepts and skills. Play makes learning fun and enjoyable at any age. If we encourage our children to explore and, to, and we can discover together with them, it's much more fun and they can discover and play on their own. Play provides an opportunity for us to learn with adults, with our children, with our peers and by themselves, and it allows for the practice of skills. So if you look at the emotional benefits of play, there's a huge amount of information that we have here on the emotional benefits of play. There is a lessening of anxiety. They can concentrate. You get persistence by, through play. They relax. There's impulse control, better self-regulation, better self-confidence, better self-esteem. They learn to experiment a lot more. The emotional benefits of play probably are the most important benefits we can get compared to any of the other domains that we actually work in. The social benefits of play, very important. When we play, we can play by ourselves, but a lot of play is something that happens out there on the playground with our children, where they're actually interacting with others. They learn conflict resolution, cooperation, sharing. They learn how to take turns when they're learning through play. They learn leadership. And interesting enough, they learn things like non-aggression. They learn how to share. They learn how to get on with each other. And I want you to take particular note of these skills that we learn through play, because we're going to be looking shortly at what happens when we don't have this opportunity to learn through play. Cognitive aspect, learn to take perspective of things. We learn to discover things through play. The other cognitive things is creativity. That's a really important aspect. Um, using our imagination, problem solving, being able to think abstractly um, is something we learn through play, through learning through the games that we do. And I'm not going to go into details. You are ECD practitioners and parents. This is not a how to play as such. It, it's what is the value of it. We construct meaning through play. So there's a lot of cognitive benefits of everything through play. Obvious physical benefits of play. Children learn to take on challenges, their gross motor skills, their fine motor skills, self-help. How do we do things by ourselves? Plenty of physical benefits that we get through our play. 
Language is an important thing that happens through play. Our vocabulary enlarges. We get emergent literacy. We learn to communicate. Children learn storytelling. They learn to tell their friends through imagination what happened. So a lot of this will happen through play. However, what happened to us? Like any other place, disaster struck. And the COVID-19, like many of you, the first three weeks lockdown, we sat there, we did our three week lockdown and we thought, huh, said goodbye to the office, said goodbye to the preschool, see you in three weeks time. Didn't make particular plans for even the plants that we have there. Extended to five weeks and eventually the ECD fraternity, we only returned literally a month ago. And this has been an incredible disaster. The University of Vermont, Alice Fothergill, she said, disasters last a long time in the lives of children. She co-authored a book called Children of Katrina, looking at the Hurricane Katrina and the huge disaster that that had in that area. And she actually examined what happened to the children. So rather than bouncing back, as many adults seem to expect, the children she examined, they seem to incorporate trauma into their growth and their future lives. Unfortunately, as adults, we often don't consider this, especially in policy making and dealing with an actual crisis. We talk about everybody being vulnerable. We talk about everything else, but often we do not talk about the children. In ECD, we especially experience that with, with, with the incredible um, confusion, if I can put it that way, and the delays in, in reopening up the ECD sector. And children are important. And we tend to just think, no, that's okay. They'll just bounce back. But what happens is there is a long-term effect on them not actually being able to play. So let's look at what happens here. What happened in play? I work in many different areas and uh, we actually manage directly four different ECD centers. One of them is in a more affluent area. One is in what, well, let's call that a suburb. One is in a township. We have one in a rural area and we have one in an informal settlement. One of the things that happened immediately was suddenly parents had no income. We turned into a food providing company instead of early childhood development. We raised money, we took food out. Um, and personally with my management team, we were on the ground actually handing out food parcels. We could see firsthand what was happening to the children that we normally are teaching. We could see in the different areas, the communities where the children were. And it was really interesting because generally the children who'd been very happy to see us, they, they, they suddenly became a little bit withdrawn. They knew something was wrong. They knew they shouldn't get too close, but they didn't know what that meant. Um, they started clinging to their parents where previously they would run around, they would run up and say hello to us. And the world became very threatening, became very unsafe to them. And they didn't know why, they couldn't actually say what was happening. And the families, because of this, they were not, they, they became less ready for play because the world was so threatening. And even now with all of us, oh, there's a peak in Gauteng, there's this there, all of us, when we're not into this, this play mood as much, we, we become a little bit nervous, if I can call it that. What happened to our children as well? Suddenly they were returned to their homes. We got, I think it was two days notice. Boom, you're going home. Take some work, off you go. Most of the homes that we work with, there's no play equipment. Even the families that have gardens, very few of them actually have jungle gyms for their children to play in. Often there's no space or there's just no facilities, depending on where you are. If you're in a, a, a place, in an informal settlement, they, yes, they're, they're, there's place outside. The children, a lot, lot more fresh air in, in some of the places we've been working in. And some of them there isn't, but there are definitely no facilities. It's, it's literally just flat grounds, roads, um, just no place. And because of the poverty, there were, there were actually fewer opportunities to play. 
um, one doesn't have money to sort of go on and, and, and download a game. There, there's no, you can't just go and purchase a game, you can't go and do something. And with a lot of our parents and a lot of the communities that we were walking around, and there's a misunderstanding of the role of play. They really didn't understand it. And what happened, there was increased screen time as children were kept inside. It's the increased screen time with the TVs, with the cell phones, um, lots of different things. And what happened with the increased screen time was there was a lot more TV violence they were exposed to. But there was this incredible focus on the pandemic numbers. If they watch TV, if their parents went on to social media, there was the numbers are this, the numbers are that. Oh, if you do this, you can be healthier. If you do that, it's not so good for you. Otherwise, you know, lots of people, if they're older, they're dying. Um, so the vocabulary that they were hearing, the, the words that the children were, were engaging with were, were scary words. Um, frightening enough for adults, but for children who couldn't really understand what's happening, yes, this was a very, a very challenging time. The other thing that affected their play was that parents were unready for the full-time care of their own children. Um, one of the reasons for this is a lot of them were working, even if they weren't. They got literally two days to actually get going. Two days, that was it. And suddenly they had to look after their children. Um, some of them had games at home. Most of them didn't. They hadn't really thought about it. Who's going to look after their children? How are they going to do this? Homes ended up being a conflict situation. There was a lot of violence. Even this week, one of the schools, this is not a preschool thing, one of our schools, um, schools, the, the preschool, a primary school is closed, a 10 year old's at home. Um, people broke in to steal the TV set. They grabbed the little girl, but thank goodness, thank God, they really did. They, they threw her out of the car shortly after the, outside the house and left her. That's the kind of violence our children are coming in for. People don't have money. Um, there's a lot more theft. There's a lot more crime than there ever was before. There's violence at home. Um, I know for myself, not violence, but conflict, yes. Um, 24 seven, I was with my husband. I haven't done that for this long before. Um, we both found areas of nitpicking. If we'd had little children, they would have been exposed to that. And one of the other thing we had parents not understanding about play is we got so many requests from parents for work for the children. Please send us some work. We would send them activities to do, creative work, um, People wanted worksheets. I had one mom who said, I really don't know how you do this, playing with toilet rolls and paint and stuff, even once a day, how do you do it? Uh, but that's how the child learns, through playing with things, through doing things. And we found an increased focus on what parents perceived as school readiness. They didn't really understand what school readiness was. So we had a lot, of, lot more explanation for them. They perceived school readiness as sitting down quietly, doing nothing, linking to the fact with parents working at home. They wanted their children to be quiet. They also wanted their children to be safe. But there were times when children had to just sit there. So TV became the babysitter. Paperwork keeps you busy. Um, all these are unnatural ways of children playing. It was very structured by the adults um, at home. They, the spontaneous play opportunities became very limited. And I believe that children were put into a stage where they became more adult pleasing than they've ever been before. So we needed to look at that. Then moving on to what about play? The professor said, we don't value play in our society. It's become a four letter word. Yes, P-L-A-Y. Ha. Huh. So what is play deprivation then? We know what's been happening. So this is what actually happened then. So it's the name given to the idea that not playing may, sorry, may deprive children of experiences that are essential to the development and may result in those being affected both biologically and socially being disabled. 
The term play deprivation was actually coined by Stuart Brown, who was a psychiatrist. And yeah, he looked at this, so it's a very interesting one. Now, what happened with all of this play deprivation, it causes both psychological and physiological consequence, but it's not limited to inhibited brain growth, the malformation of vital areas of the brain, the malfunction of centers which control neurochemical levels, behavior irritability, neural dysfunction, and the lack of mental well-being. That's one of the things. So social emotional learning that allows safe play between children actually happens quite slowly. So the child who is not having those experiences of healthy play, they can overdo the play process or simply sometimes not understand what is going on. Those children returning to a social, coming into a social environment for the first time again, they can become isolated or bullied and they become bullies. So the lingering effects of the, this childhood play, deficit, deprivation, can actually carry on way into adult life. The other thing we saw happening quite often was this helicopter parent, helicopter parenting. Hmm. And I must say, with this helicopter parenting, one of the things that kept happening was suddenly we saw helicopter parenting from parents who've never actually experienced anything like that at all. And helicopter parents are those who, if you've never heard of the word before, those who hover around their children, just like a helicopter. And parents then, they, they often would orchestrate, put it all together, how they think the children should play rather than leaving them free to respond. And what happens is that children become skilled at pleasing adults rather than spontaneous play because they see the parent wanting certain behaviors from them so they try and give them those behaviors and we need them to be spontaneous because if children don't play they are going to find that 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 that, that authentic exuberance that, that let's just play for play's sake that is so obvious when they're outdoors and they play freely that is not happening if they're playing so looking at that we, we need to be sure that children actually have this play because if it's disrupted very early, then what happens is, for instance, this thing about helicopter parenting, they found, Brian Sutton Smith was the person, he said adults who continuously disrupt group processes, for instance, in a, an ECD forum or a church organization, you can normally find that they had play deprivation in their childhood, which kept them from belonging. So it disrupted their early childhood development and gave them a lack of social skills and making them dif difficult to participate in cooperative activities when they are adults. So even there, this helicopter parenting was something we started seeing, which is something which is quite challenging for the children. Play, as we said, vital for normal brain development, particularly zero to seven. So chronic play deprivation actually has a gradually dehumanizing effect on children because they have a consequent loss of ability to care, to emphasize or exercise compassion, or even share the same realities as other children. And what happens is that the evidence says that children become disturbed, aggressive, and violent adults. And the, there's a really early study going back to 1960s where they made a link between play deprivation, violent and antisocial behavior. And I'm going to talk about this violent and disturbed adults. They found that play deprivation in childhood in numerous interviews conducted with some of America's most violent criminals. They actually were deprived of play. And I think one of the things is that they looked at this and they found the play experience of those people who actually committed murder were actually vastly different to other human beings. Their childhoods were typically characterized by isolation, abuse, or bullying. And when they looked at these people, many of them, in fact, none of them, they said, in 6,000 individuals, reported 
family recollections of being on a playground, being rough and tumble play, having fun. They couldn't remember their playground friends. They had, they were bullied. Um, they inappropriately acted out the aggression, thinking that that was how you play. And normal antisocial behavior is virtually absent from normal, sorry, normal play behavior, virtually absent from all these violent criminals. And so play behaved children, play deprived children are forerunners of social breakdown. One of the things that happened, a lot of our children were kept inside and we find that outdoor play decreased by 71% in one generation in the US and UK, intergeneration play and family games also in decline. That was a study. What has happened now? That is what's happened literally under the COVID lockdown. We have suddenly got all of these incredible things where outdoor play has stopped. And it, it, it's really, really sad because we need to bring back outdoor play. Outdoor play is absolutely crucial for so many skills. And if we look at this outdoor play, we are going to see that a lot of the children here don't have the time a lot of the parents are not making the time for their children to actually be going outdoors. And looking at this is actually really tragic because we need to be outdoors. We need to be doing things like this. And if we look at some of these indicators of what's happening, I'm going to ask each one of you there just to really look at yourself, really think about it. As I said, this has not just affected our children. It's affected us as adults. And if we're not going to be playful and working with our, um, playing with our children, playing with our family members, how are our children ever going to get that right? There's six signs that I've put up here. One, can you remember the last time you played a game with your children, family, or friends? If you can't, there's a problem. When is the last time you actually played with your children on the playground? especially now that the playgrounds, uh, the preschools are reopening. Maybe you haven't tried something new and fun just because you felt like it in ages. When was the last time you put something into, yes, we have to plan, um, but we need to plan for free play as well, for unstructured play. When is the time you just did something just because you felt like it? Maybe you haven't done it in a long, long time. Maybe for you, creative play and your children, it's no longer fun. Maybe the creativity that, they, that, you, that you do with your children, maybe the work that you're putting out for them, maybe it's not as much fun. Maybe it's become an, an area for perfectionism, self-criticism, comp competition or stress. Huh. Maybe you aren't including fun activities that let the children experience that amazing feeling of just losing track of time where you see them out there so engrossed in their own play, in their own time, that they're just not even looking around. They're chatting with their friend by themselves, playing there. Maybe there's no form of play that actively engages their body, their hands, their senses. Maybe you've stopped that because TV, reading, and computers don't count. Okay, not talking about reading to your children, I mean reading for yourself. Okay, those don't include your body, so we can't talk about those. And maybe a big sign is if the adults are not actually connecting with their children through play. We need to be playing with our children, actually getting down to their level, working with them. I saw some great things people shared with me where people were getting down to their child's level, playing with them. Are we doing that as parents and ECD practitioners? Because if we're not, there's six signs that you and the children you're working with or, or bringing up may be play deprived. What is the way forward, forward for all of this? Well, I think one of the most important things we're looking at is we're looking at a public and health crisis and a societal challenge that can actually last generations if we don't work at it now. We need to really be doing something for all of our children. We need to be realizing 
the importance that the play deprivation has had on our children and that it's having and with all the new operating protocols that are coming into place not to deprive children of the opportunity to play still. The social and emotional learning that is fundamental in play behavior is actually vital for human survival. Um, yeah, we could be killing ourselves off if we're not doing this. We need to recognize that major play deprivation is actually akin to child abuse. I put in their prescription for play. I know a doctor who works with children and one of the prescriptions he has done is he's actually said to the parents, he said, go and play with your children. I'm giving you a prescription to play. You need to play with them. This is what has to happen for you. So that is what is happening. So we need to get play being prescribed. It's the right thing to get our children right. All of us need to advocate for and protect unstructured play as well as playful learning. You need to make sure that it's happening. And part of that is an intrinsic part of, of um, many of the programs that it needs to be there as part of the program, is our children need choices. They need to be able to make choices. I know it's very difficult at the moment because we are having to sanitize the equipment. We are having to make sure that there's not as much sharing. In fact, sharing shouldn't be happening as much as we can. But we can still have choices and we can still play. They still need to be able to choose what are they going to be doing. There's another interesting thing on the next page is that parents and caregivers, big thing, identify your own play nature. Recognize the spontaneous play natures of the children, but allow an environment that can actually let play happen. Play is not going to happen in a household where children can't touch things. It is not going to happen in an environment where there is nowhere for the children to play, where they can only be inside all the time. It cannot happen. The normal play at our ECD centers have to be given space. They have to be given a time. Have to be given a time where children can just play and be themselves. Because it is so complicated, that learning process through play. Yep, equally as complicated as learning to read. Because play equals learning. Children that engage playfully, playfully, they will remember their learning experiences. If it's joyful and there's a playful teacher, playful parent, the children definitely learns better if they're having fun. If there's incredible pressure, like you must do this, you must do that, you must do this, and too many rules, play is not going to flourish. So it's got to be infused into that system just because it makes learning joyful. Important, with our early childhood children, not to separate work and play. We need to honor the fact that humans need to be in a state of play. It, it, it's literally a public health necessity that we play. And at the moment, it's as important as hand washing. It's important as wearing masks. It's important as physical distancing because it's the future health and mental health of our society that's at stake if we are actually diminishing their play opportunities and what will happen. So we've got to do all of these things as we go forward. And one of the things to mention is the benefits of outdoor play. It's probably one of the most important things we can actually look at. And outdoor play is critical. It's an active form of learning. In fact, until the age of eight, learning occurs best when the whole self is involved. And looking at this is really important. So we need to have things like an adventure playground. Um, it needs to be an open facility, a, a, a place outside where children can have fun. There are things to do. There are things to discover for them. They can engage in a whole range of activity. They can play with, with, with the ground. They can play with, with, with um, the sticks. They can play with different things outside, under your control. Make sure you have put out choices for them. It's, it's not just a case of, here's a place, go play. What is there that, that's making them think? It's, it's got a real place for it. That they could confront and learn to manage the risk in that environment. How do they do that? That is really an important thing. 
um, it, it needs to be a place where nature is, where something's happening, where unstructured play can happen because your smell, your touch, your taste, there's a sense of motion through space. Those are all incredibly powerful ways of learning through They, they, they gain uh, the ability Hello. Hello. you're still there Robin keep, keep am going. I okay my laptop just completely turned off and I don't know what happened to everything could you just hold on is it sharing still yes okay I'm sorry there's a, a, a the Grinch has come to visit if you could just let me stop a minute and see what's going on. Okay, sorry, if you can just hold on a minute. I'm just going to carry on talking though, because one of the things to do is that as they gain competence walking outside, it lays the foundation for the children to, to take a risk. Um, let me just see if I can get that screen back again. Okay. Sorry, hold on a minute, everybody. These things do happen at the best of times. Okay. I'm just going to quickly go down. Sorry, there's no quick way when you're sharing screens to do this. Yeah, so outdoor play. And the gain competence in moving through this larger world. And one of the most important things for me, and a, an amazing takeaway for me doing a lot of research, was that we actually beat earlier plagues through outdoor classes. In the last century, in the 20th century, there were a couple of plagues. One was TB, the other one was um, the Spanish flu. What they did in two major cities in America is they decided that they were going to have outdoor classes. And I'm going to show you some pictures from there. What they did was they actually put the children outside. Now, this is really interesting. Um, obviously, it's more senior children. They put what they called um, hot water blankets around them, which were hot water bottles in these, in these um, amazing blankets. The children sat outside in these um, open air places, this one is on a roof. They turned a roof into a, an outdoor classroom. None of the children got sick. Not one of these children in these outdoor classrooms fell prey to the Spanish flu in these areas. It was in New York City, you can see up there. Okay, and then, and none of them fell got the TB, which is just as contagious. It was a whole pandemic that went through. Really interesting. So I know this is not a picture of ours. These are older children. Could happen, work for our older children too. But with our children, let's encourage outdoor learning. They've said the ch chance of children actually catching, the chance of anybody catching this COVID-19 outdoors decreases hugely because of the viral load, because it's in the outdoors, because it's in fresh air. It's one of the reasons why in our operating protocols, we say there has to be ventilation. You have to have your windows open. This is absolutely crucial. Our windows have to be open um, as part of the protocols because of the fresh air. So one of the things we need to do, why not have it outside? Dress up warmly and out we go. And I think one of the big challenges we have is a lot of you, any, well, most of you who work with um, in the early childhood sector should know the work of James Heckman, who's the Nobel Laureate in Economics. He did incredible work on early education, and early education has the biggest impact on an economy compared to any other activity, but the effects of adverse early childhood environments persist over an entire lifetime. So we have to look at their play. Children need a balance of Exploratory play. Where can they explore? What can they do? They need to be able to play with different objects. They need sensory play. 
within our early childhood environments, the sensory play cannot be shared. Many of the ECD centers have actually now got separate little um, Play-Doh boxes for each one of their children. They put their own Play-Doh into their own little box. They've got everything. This is play. They can choose what they're playing with that. They need constructive play. They need games with rules. They do need some rules. We do need to teach them that, but then they can break the rules. They can have their own rules, do what they want to do. Physical play is important because, and dramatic play. So we need, we need to get this balance of all this play right. So to finish off then, spontaneous and creative play. That is the freedom to choose when, what, where, with, or without whom we actually play. And it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than anything else. I mentioned James Hickman just now. I'm going to go back to that screen. James Hickman, one of the most important things we can remember from his research is he actually said that if we don't get the first five years right, we've got a 70% chance of being arrested for a violent crime. We can see why. Those studies they did on the violent criminals, those um, all the murderers that they had, all those violent criminals, over 6,000 of them, all had abnormal or play experiences when they were little, they were deprived of the opportunity for real play. Maybe this is why, that if we don't get the first five years right, these statistics are horrifying. And there's only a 30% chance of accessing tertiary education if we don't get the first five years right. So we need to be playing out, doing this sort of stuff. It may seem trivial to our industrial societies, but it exists because it helps us adapt to each other. It's a basic aspect of socialization. It lets us have more fun with each other. Yes, it helps us from killing each other. It allows us to cooperate and develop with each other. So spontaneous creative play. It's the freedom to choose when, what, where, with or without whom we want to play. Play is truly the work of children. Instead of play deprived upbringings, we need to have play saturated learning so saturated that it is everything we do is learning through play and i really really pray and hope that this is what we're going to be doing to get our children out of this time where we've had them where they've been tucked away inside they haven't had a chance to play they haven't been outdoors they haven't actually had the stimulation and the fun that they are used to having Thank you so much. Let's have some questions. So, what questions Sorry, I'm coming. do we have? That's great. Right. Now, I've got questions. Um, sorry. Right. Robin, phew, that was just so much to take on board. Um, and I, my, my wish and my prayer that is that every single teacher and parent in South Africa or the rest of the world for that matter could have listened to what you had to share with us this afternoon because it's just tugged at my heartstrings again and it breaks my heart as to what our children have been through in the last couple of months. Um, I have got a couple of questions and interestingly enough, um, a couple of the questions are very interlinked. So um, we'll be answering many questions in one. Um, but thank you to the people who have sent through questions. Unfortunately, we can't um, take all of them. But I'm going to start with a question that's, which says, how do you encourage fr free play with a child who is an only child? As he says, he doesn't want to play with me, but with his cousins and friends of his own age. I presume this is a child at home. Mm. Um, how do you encourage free play? I think one has to really dig deep to engage with them at the moment um, and find out what is it. And I think it's digging deep into, as an adult, your own playful nature. Because sometimes, yes, they do want to play with their cousins, etc. If they can go back to their early learning center, it's probably the main reason for them to go back. Bearing in mind that the transmission between early, um, between our um, under fives, is literally zero according to everything. 
they, they are the least at risk um, sector of our entire population. All over the world, ECD centers have remained open throughout the um, throughout lockdowns, throughout spikes, throughout everything, and the children have not had a case of, of the coronavirus. So the best thing to do is if you can get them back into an environment where they can play, which would be their early learning center, check it out. Make sure that they've done what they need to be doing. Are they, are they safe? Have they got the social distancing? Because we've come up with ways to do that. Um, there are screens, there are places to play, but within it, it is encouraged. Children, when they come into school, it's in the protocols, can engage with each other because their rate of transmission is literally zero. The South African Pediatric Association has said that, worldwide studies have said that. The transmission at schools, preschools, early childhood centers, the dangerous thing would be adults to adults, not any, not, not, not children amongst each other. But as a play thing with your own child, very important, get down on the ground with them, put it out there and you say, well, I have to be your friend for now. What are we going to play? Don't you try and dictate what's happening. Let them dictate it. Thank you I for hope that. that helps. Absolutely. And then it's interesting. I actually wrote this down while you were chatting and I have a teacher who has sent in a question that um, also go, goes along the same line, but a parent has sent in the same kind of question. And I think it all goes around the pressure of teaching the children what they've missed out on during the COVID time. But this parent, I think, has written um, economy opening versus Oh, my eyes. encompassing the family life and values with our children. When they come back to ECD sites, they will also be suffering trauma. Would teachers understand um, they would need to be supporting these children first and maybe through play activities instead of curriculum-based activities? That is probably something I know within the Preschools for Africa network and many of the others, Masenzo Casas and all these other people that we work with, we really encourage them in the ECD world as they come back to early childhood development. First thing to do, we, we have trained our, um, all of our staff on how do you handle trauma with children. Interestingly, they've actually benefited as well, but they know this and we've actually emphasized that the first things they need to do are the activities they've learned, which are all through play, on how to, now there isn't, 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 isn't a chance here to give you a whole trauma counseling um, session, but how do they actually, through play, engage with those children? We have to assume that every single one has been traumatized in one way or another, because they have, to a greater or lesser degree, and our first activities should be trauma-based play counseling basically with every single one of our children to get them to be um, well integrated back into what's happening. Um, there are various free trauma courses all over Facebook if you just have a look. Absolutely. And then, and then one last question is, how do we deal with parents who, who are fearing sending their children back to school? <laughs> I, I don't have an answer. It's a very natural fear. Um, what one, one fears for your children. And I mean, we've had some parents who say, thank goodness you're open. Yeah, have my children. And then the other ones are like, okay, we'll take this very slowly. I think a lot of it is to do with, um, if you go backwards, what has your relationship been with them? Do they know, do they trust you? What have you been doing on the ground? Taking photos of what is happening, sending them videos if necessary, of how you've prepared the whole center and yes, we, we've opened up um, two of the four centers already. The other two we are still working on purely because, okay, parents at the one haven't got a huge demand for us yet, but it's just been us getting ourselves ready. As adults, we've had to get ready. There's an incredible amount of work, but you need to tell them that that's what's happening. Keep them involved, keep them up to date. Tell them the statistics, tell them the facts, tell them, bring your child, maybe one day a week, start off with, see what happens, have a look. 
because obviously parents cannot come onto the into the ECD um, environment. We're not allowed visitors as nobody is in the schools. But I think just reassure them of the measures you've taken. It's their choice ultimately if they want to bring the children back. Some parents who are at home will prefer to keep their children at home. That's fine. It, 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 it's, it has to be about the children. And this is what is so difficult because it's also our businesses as well. And we need to run those businesses. But like any change, they had a huge change for four months. It's almost four months now. They're now going to have to learn the change of bringing their children back to the ECD centers. And we need to be gentle and we need to just keep up that relationship. If they aren't there, phone them. How is it today? Can we help you? Are there, is there anything you want? We've had a week. Nothing's happened. Things are going well. Bring your child if you want to. If you don't, how can we support you? And it's really about that relationship that you need to have with the parent all along to see how can they do that. And there will come a time. We've had one parent who just says, I'm only bringing my child because I have to go for an interview. Okay, great. Brought their child. Great. They'll bring their child back now because they, they, they're starting to trust us again. And it, is, and it is all about trust. And it's going to happen slowly, but surely, and it will happen. Hang in there. I think the sad thing is that um, we had the children for such a short time at the beginning of the year that that trust, hadn't, that trust relationship hadn't been cemented yet. So teachers out there, double the work. Um, yep. Just to keep reassuring um, your parents. And it's vitally important that the children do get back to some form of normal. Um, we speak about the new normal, but we need to go Absolutely. back to the old normal as well, just Very for security, much so. for security um, with yes. our children. Absolutely. Um, and, and just on that note, if you could keep your eyes open on the ACSI social media and our webpage, um, because we are having a parent um, Zoom in our next Thursday evening with a lady called Nikki Bush, who Absolutely. is a yeah. parent um, specialist. And please invite as many of your parents at your schools that, as you can, just to, so that they can be reassured as to what is happening at schools and the whole thing behind the, the COVID. Um, but keep up your good work. But Robin, I'd just really like to thank you for your time today. Um, always loads and loads, loads of wisdom coming from you. And I, and, and I hope that our participants this afternoon have learned a lot from you. I'm sure Robin would be very open to um, further communication with whoever's out there and you would like more dialogue with her. Um, yes. she, she does have a website with all her information there so or you can contact me for that information. Um, but as I say um, next week Thursday afternoon we have a leadership webinar with a man called Andy Brupp, which is promising to be very interesting. Then next Thursday evening, we've got Nikki Bush, um, who's doing the parent webinar. And then on the 6th of August, ECD people, please take note, I've invited a speech therapist to come and speak to you. Um, so many of our children are, are battling with auditory processing disorders or language disorders of one type of another. And they rely on our facial expressions um, and to read lips, to learn language. And we all covered up with masks and shields at the moment. And this is having a huge effect on our children's learning um, and affecting their communication skills as well. So I'll see you here again in two weeks time on the 6th of August. Um, and I'll have Bianca, a, a Johannesburg based speech therapist with me who has done a lot of research into this topic. But thank you so much to everybody for joining us this thank afternoon. Thank you. And thank you once again, Robin. Um, we really, really appreciate you. Um, thank God you, everybody. And keep up the good work that you are doing because yeah. you really are special people out there. And once again, we put our children first. But God bless you and good afternoon. Absolutely. God Thanks. bless you, everybody. Hang in there. All will be good.